Hello, welcome to Node Spaghetti. My name is Joseph, and this is episode 3 of Making an Octopus in Blender 2.81. Now, I apologize in advance if I sound just completely awful. That's because I feel completely awful. I have a cold. Sorry about that. But that's not going to stop me from making this video. And I've got some other stuff planned that hopefully I'll have time and heal fast enough to get done sooner rather than later. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, without further ado, let's get started. In the last episode, I was working on the tentacles of the octopus and getting the topology right for them. In this episode, I'll be connecting the tentacles together, and then I'll get started working on the head. Now, in the first place, what I've got to do is get the tentacles shaped to the sculpt. It doesn't have to be perfect because the sculpt isn't quite perfect yet, even still. And then I'm going to be making the webbing between the tentacles. I'm going to start by cutting a sliver of octopus skin out for each tentacle and just marking off the shape, the extent of the webbing. Now, there are several things in this video that I have to do several times because there are many tentacles. First of all, it was stupid for me not to, uh, not to use four-way mirror symmetry at this point so that I'd only have to do it twice. Instead, I'd have to do it four times because I'm only doing bilateral symmetry. Stupid. I was not thinking ahead the way I should have. Anyhow, I've tried to speed those parts up even more than normal, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem. <laughs> now this video is mostly going to be retopology, and I actually didn't know uh, exactly how to tackle a lot of these problems, so most of this video is exploratory retopology, if, if that makes sense. I'm exploring different ways of solving the problem, and uh, I think I actually end up redoing most of what I do in this video, so I'll have plenty of time to talk about other stuff in the meantime. The second topic this week is, make the computer do the work for you. Something you've probably noticed by now about the way I work is that I use hotkeys continually. I always try my hardest to avoid using gizmos and widgets. Whenever I can, I prefer to duplicate something I've already done, rather than do it again. I use lots of add-ons, and whenever I get frustrated by a task, I write an add-on or script to speed it up. That is, if someone else hasn't already made one for me that I can just download. In short, I try to work with the computer. Or even better, I make the computer do the work for me. All I do is make decisions. And you can see an example of this here. I've duplicated the faces that I made when I retopologized the first set of webbing between the first two tentacles. And I'm going to go ahead and reuse those faces so that it stays consistent and so that I don't have to make them over and over again. All I have to do is sew them into place. Back to the point. I've mentioned that I like to have the computer do all the work for me. What is a computer anyways? A computer is what digital artists use to do all of our work. It is the paint, the paintbrush, the palette, and the canvas. A painter, before any paint meets the brush, thinks about the palette she needs to bring with her. She chooses paints that work well together, pigments that produce vibrant color when mixed. She takes the time to learn how the colors change as the paint dries, and how one type of paint dries faster or slower than another. She learns the right way to use gesso and turpentine to treat and prime the paper before she sets out to do a painting, and the right way to clean her brushes and prepare the bristles. A great painter knows the tools of the trade intimately. It's just necessary if you want to produce great work. And that's what it takes to stand out against the crowd of mediocre artists, knowing your trade. So again, what is a computer? A computer is a machine. Nothing more, nothing less. Its parts move in just the right way, its pieces are arranged in exactly the right order. It takes an input and produces an output. Nowhere in this wiry web of transistors and capacitors is a device that makes decisions of any kind. All of the pieces of the machine merely do what they must as a consequence of their physical properties. There may be thousands of times as many parts, and each one may be more complicated than any combination of flywheels and cogs, but a computer is just a sophisticated clock. Wind it up and it will tell you the time. And this is why it is so important to understand what the computer is doing, and how it works. It always does exactly what you tell it to do. The computer is never uncooperative. It never disobeys, makes mischief, or stalls for time, nor can it. If the computer does the wrong thing, it is because a human has commanded it to. This is a simple idea, but it has profound implications. The computer will do anything you ask it to precisely and instantly. It's up to you to tell it what to do. After all, the only thing the computer knows is data. 
the words in the UI, the colorful pixels in the viewport, and the faces and vertices that make up an octopus, all of these are numbers in the computer's memory. The computer is good at doing anything that doesn't require decision making, but it can't make decisions because it can't see the big picture. It doesn't know the purpose of any kind of data, it merely knows what kind of math it can do with it. And really, it's a stretch to say the computer knows anything at all. The human, on the other hand, is blessed with the gift of intuition. We can see the purpose of a task or an object from the start until the end. We think ahead about the emotional impact of a character's design while we create the shapes that make it up. Humans are good at making decisions. We aren't, however, good at repeating mindless tasks precisely. It's hard to hold a human's interest. At any rate, so says Google Analytics. <laughs> Now the key to working quickly is to have the computer do all of the precise mindless tasks for you while you make the decisions. Ideally all of your time as a human will be making decisions and the computer does all of the work for you. In practice we still have a lot of work to do ourselves. Often I'm appalled at how little digital artists concern themselves with the inner workings of the computer that they use to do all of their work. I see people struggling against the program whenever they don't understand it. They make an assumption about how it works and are surprised when it doesn't behave the way they expect it to. And when a tool doesn't work the way they want, they're forced to do things themselves instead, one at a time. Most of the time, when the task at hand seems to require lots of tedious work, it's the user's error, not knowing how to use the software. As an example, I present the collapse edge loop function. The collapse edge loop function takes two loops of edges and collapses the ring between them and turns the two loops into one loop. And I'll put an overlay in the video so you can see what I'm talking about. Now before I knew about the collapse edge loop function in the edit mode delete menu, I used to select two vertices at a time and choose alt M and at center every time for dozens of vertices. Eventually I got a little smarter and began to use shift R to repeat the merge operator. Finally, I tried Collapse Edge Loop out of curiosity when I noticed it in my delete menu and realized I had never used it before. Just like that, it became one of my favorite modeling tools, and it's extremely fast in comparison. Before, I had to click twice, press two keyboard keys, and click again for every pair of vertices. Now, I alt-click once to select the edge ring, and then press X and C, and it's all done for me. Over time, I learned to quit blaming the computer when I ran across one of these situations, and start to seek solutions instead. Now, whenever I run across something that I have to do multiple times, I try to find a way to speed it up, instead of just doing it over and over again by hand. More often than not, the tool is right there in the software, and I just didn't know its name before I decided to look for it. Sometimes the name is different than what I expect, sometimes the names are different between softwares, and you just have to work a little harder to find out what it is. But a little learning now always has a lot of payoff later. Even still, sometimes the tool isn't in the software. What to do then? If you can do it by hand, you can teach the computer to do it too. Many applications have ways of recording macros or actions to do this. But ultimately, in order to do this really well, you'll have to learn to speak to the computer in its own language. In Blender, this is Python. Python is close to the perfect scripting language. It's easy to read and write, and accessible to the beginner, but it's powerful enough that professional programmers use it as a workhorse for scientific, business, and creative applications. It provides you with the power to tell Blender exactly what to do in any situation. In addition, you can use what you've learned with Blender in many other applications, because Python is extremely popular and portable. For example, Python is installed on Mac OS and Linux operating systems by default. You don't even have to install it yourself. Most creative applications use Python also. For example, Blender, obviously, and Krita and GIMP. Maya has a Python API binding, as does Max and Moto and Houdini, Lightwave and Cinema 4D. Basically all of the 3D suites use Python. Godot uses a modified form of Python as GDScript and Nuke uses Python for its API. And there's just no limit to the kind of useful things you can use Python for outside of your creative application. For example, one time I needed to render a Maya scene on a computer that did not have Maya installed. Now, fortunately, the rendering engine I was using had a standalone application that I could put on any computer. But it obviously couldn't automate the rendering process the way that Maya does with the batch render command. 
So what I did was I wrote a Python script to modify all of the scene files to use the same common directory for shaders, and then another Python script to automate rendering them one at a time, and naming them sequentially. I saved so many hours doing this because I was able to use a much faster computer than the one that I had installed Maya on. And of course I couldn't have used Maya on the fast computer because you know how expensive the license is for that terrible piece of Making your living with a computer without knowing how to code is like going to Madrid, opening a restaurant, and only taking orders in English. Maybe it can be done, but the majority of your customers will speak Castilian. And in any case, you won't make it long in Spain without learning how to say Quiero Agua or Donde Esta El Baño. So, if you want to work with the computer for a living, you should do your best to meet it halfway. That's how you'll get the best use out of it. Work with the computer instead of only expecting it to work for you. It doesn't take much. Simply knowing how to write a for loop to set the properties of all of the selected objects, for example, can save you minutes or hours every time you use the script. And you don't have to learn it all right away. But it's part of being a well-balanced artist. An artist who can code will always be worth more than an artist who can't, because she can work faster. Don't settle for merely using your computer. Be in control of your computer. So there are a few principles that you can follow while working that will help you to be more in control of your computer. The first one is, don't trust the computer. Oftentimes, an algorithmic result will be mathematically correct, but it won't be aesthetically correct. For example, if you use a computer to pack the UVs of an object, it will jam them in there just as tight as it can figure out how to do, but usually it's not as tight as if a human had packed them by hand, and when the human packs the UVs, she can set it up so that they're easy to use for the texture artist. For example, the character's body will be facing right side up instead of any who knows what kind of random orientation it would have after packing it automatically. Many computer algorithms are arbitrary, they use a heuristic to decide what to do, but there isn't actually a right or a wrong, or at the very least there's no right or wrong that the computer can tell is better than one or the other. So, in any case where the computer is making a decision, don't let it make the decision. Don't trust the computer. Do it yourself. But of course it is okay to use the computer's answer to the problem as a basis or a starting point. But you should never just take the computer's word for anything. Always second guess it because it doesn't know how to make good decisions. The second thing you can do is expect more from your computer. And if you ever run across a situation where you're being forced to do all kinds of boring monkey work by hand, that's the computer's job. The computer should be doing it for you. It's ridiculous that you, a human, should be wasting your valuable time doing stupid, worthless, tedious crap. So whenever you find yourself in that situation, take a second, pause, and look it up. Chances are, some computer geek has already figured out how to do it a lot faster. Usually it's the computer geek that wrote the software to begin with. But sometimes it's someone in the community that gets mad and frustrated because the computer geeks that wrote the software didn't do their job and write the tool that we need to do our jobs. Completely unrelated aside, if you are rigging characters in Blender and you want more tools in edit mode, check out my add-on Chain Tools on GitLab. I'll put a link in the description. And anyways, the final piece of advice I have for working with the computer is always plan ahead. Think carefully about what kind of tools you have at your disposal, and plan to use the ones that, that uh, save you the most work. Oftentimes, the difference between spending 30 minutes on a task and spending 5 minutes on a task is merely the order of operations in which you do the, the, the various tasks. A sort of obvious example is setting up the constraints on one half of an armature before you mirror the armature over because when you mirror the armature, you can duplicate the constraints and just get them over again. That way you don't have to set up a dozen or more constraints by hand every time. And anyways, that's the video. We've just about finished retopologizing our octopus, except for all of the terrible mistakes that I made and have to go back and fix later on. <laughs> but we'll be finishing the retopology probably in the next video. And uh, stay tuned, I've got other videos coming. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to share this video. Make sure to like it. Maybe think about subscribing to my channel if you think I'm worth it. And uh, I'll be making more videos as soon as I recover from this gosh darn cold. So thank you again so, so much. This has been Joseph with Node Spaghetti.